Uh, welcome to the Leslie E. Lab. I'm Frank Romanofsky. I'm the executive director of the Entrepreneurial Institute. We run the Leslie E. Lab, the Startup School Speaker Series, the Innovation Venture Fund, which I also run, which uh, invests in startups founded by NYU students, faculty, and researchers. Um, and we also run a whole host of other programs. I won't bore you with uh, an infomercial today, um, but I've been investing in startups since 1998, um, so I've seen a few pitches over the years and have uh, helped a lot of entrepreneurs work on their pitches. Um, so I don't profess to be uh, an expert or guru, but I, I've seen a few. Um, question for you guys. Uh, so first off, who's new to the Leslie E-Lab today? Anybody? A couple of you. Okay, good. Welcome. Um, who's new to startup school? Okay, good. Uh, and who is actively working on a startup that's thinking about raising money in the next six months? Maybe a year. Maybe a year? Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, who here is an undergraduate student? You're fa I'll get to you. Um, who here is a grad student? Any postdocs in the audience? And faculty? Yep, they used to be grad students. Okay. Um, anybody else who I didn't cover? All right, I also, okay, last set of questions, then I'll get started. So I'd like to know what schools are represented here. So uh, CAS. We actually don't have it on the title application. It's, it's not an it doesn't say College of Arts and Science? No, it's not there. Okay, we got to fix that. That's the largest college in the university. That's probably an error. It was there at one point, so that we'll, we will look at apologies for that. We don't mean to disrespect the College of Arts and Science. Uh, who's here from Stern? From Gallatin? Tandon? Courant? Uh, who am I leaving? I know medicine. Who else? SPS. SPS. Liberal studies. Liberal studies. Anyone else? Okay. Cool. I just like to know who I'm talking to. Um, so this one I want to <clears throat> kind of touch. Actually, one more question. Who attended the um, when and how to raise venture capital talk I did earlier in the semester? Okay. So a few of you. Uh, this will make more sense to maybe those of you than, uh, than uh, I'm not going to try to rehash much of that. I will touch on a little bit of it. Uh, if you, um, I think either from this semester or last semester, well, I know those slides are available on, sli on our SlideShare channel. I don't know, do you know if the video from that talk is up yet? Not yet. If you, uh, if you go to our web page, um, on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see our, our Twitter, our Facebook, our YouTube channel, our SlideShare channel, and I think Instagram, maybe. Um, so you can get access to them there. SlideShare? You never heard of SlideShare? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the icon that you don't know, then. It's my process of deduction. You probably know the others. That's OK. Um, so when to pitch, the role of the pitch, what you need to do before the pitch, and then we're going to um, tear down uh, a pitch I found online. It's a fictitious pitch, but it's, a, it's an OK one. And we'll talk about what's good and bad about it as, as an example or case study. Um, and then I'll share with you some of my pet peeves, the things that piss me off when I get pitches. And, and, and it says Q&A at the end, but at any point in time, if you have a question, just raise your hand or, or, or blurt it out. Um, I want to make this interactive and make sure everyone stays awake. So the first question of when to pitch. Now, for those of you who saw my when and how to raise venture capital talk, I showed a chart that looked, if not very similar, identical uh, to this. And these are the four stages uh, that we like to talk about uh, startup development, right? Customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and company building. Okay, I won't bother reading the definitions of what each of those means. The, the, the one thing I will point out is that these first two phases are really when you're trying to figure everything out, when you're searching for the answers to who's your customer, what's your value proposition, how much are they willing to pay, 
What, how are you going to acquire customers? What's your distribution strategy? All those kind of basic fundamental things. This is when you're beginning to shift into execution mode, okay? When you're uh, beginning to build demand, improve the way you acquire customers, and then as you see here, this is really when we're beginning to put our pedal to the metal. Now, when most people think about, well, not most, but many people think about raising money over here from venture capitalists. And venture, unless your name is Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or Elon Musk, venture capitalists don't invest in entrepreneurs or startups in, in, these, in these phases. The, the funds, as I'll talk to more in a second, really look to invest to scale, okay, to help scale something that's beginning to work in the marketplace. Okay? Um, the angels and VCs will invest a little bit earlier, but when you're in this discovery phase, this is not really when you're raising money. Okay, this is a, a great place to take advantage of grants like the Venture Well grants or Green Grants programs and others we have within the university. Um, competitions are a great place, you know, like the Entrepreneur's Challenge or Innovation, which Tim would love to tell you more about. Uh, if you have time, um, and, and other competitions, not just within the university, but outside the university as well. Um, and actually, while you're a student, there's actually a tremendous number of, of uh, resources available to you that may not be available uh, afterwards. But the truth is, this is not a very expensive phase. In most, this is largely about going out, talking to customers, and testing uh, your assumptions about the need or problem that you believe you're solving. Okay. As you move into the validation phase, and you know, clearly if you're building a hardware or physical product, that might be a little bit more expensive than uh, maybe software if you have the ability to build upon it. Uh, but this is when things like, uh, again, grants, crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those are great resources at that stage. We have had a lot of startups uh, that have uh, had success in that. Customers, okay, not necessarily as an investor, but as a source of capital, you know you've hit upon a dire customer need or problem and a potential solution to address it if they're willing to pay for it before you have it. And that might sound crazy, but customers do that all the time. They want to will something into existence. The best way to do that is to uh, essentially pre-order. And if you think about it, that's exactly what Kickstarter is. Right? Very few products that ever, everyone know kind of vaguely what Kickstarter is, right? The notion of crowdfunding. Okay, very, very few products are actually built at the time that people run the Kickstarter campaigns. Usually, they're doing elaborate mock-ups and videos and maybe a working prototype, but then they use the funding from Kickstarter to, if it's a physical good in particular, to acquire the inventory and materials that they need to build it and ultimately ship it. And often, when you fund a Kickstarter product, you might not actually receive product for 6 to 12 months. Yes? Uh, there's also Indiegogo. Yes. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, for... That's from when I started working for Okay. I, I, I can't speak to that, but the, we've had teams that have worked successfully on both Indiegogo and Kickstarter, or Indiegarter. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, we like them both. We just had um, Julio Terra, who's an NYU alum here last Friday, Thursday, talking about Kickstarter, but we love them both. They're both great platforms and can be really really valuable. We've had a lot of successful startups use them. Um, SBIR and STTR is, um, particularly if you're thinking about commercializing research, this is a great program uh, run by the federal government. Uh, they invest about $3 billion, billion dollars a year in small businesses through this program, through all, <coughs> all the major federal research agencies, National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, and others. Um, this is where you start to see accelerators coming into the play, things like Techstars, Y Combinator, uh, where you, you have some evidence that there's a there there, that there's something worth building, and your team has the hustle and commitment and all the other things that they're looking for. And, and this can be a great way to get a little bit of money and a lot of mentorship and coaching and support and visibility to take your startup to the next level. And in terms of other investors, you know, this is when you start to see friends and family come in. And friends and family is not a euphemism. It literally means your friends and family. And they invest in you because they love you and they believe in you and they care about you. 
Um, they're probably not professional investors. They're probably really not thinking about all the risks or the return on investment other than, yes, it's a, you know, it's, it's a startup and they believe in you and that's great. Um, but that can be, you know, sometimes people raise in the hundreds of thousands of dollars collectively from friends and family. It's good to have friends and family who can write checks like that. Where professional investors come into play, and, and this will vary a bit from sector to sector, um, but even in, <coughs> is anyone here working on, a, on developing a therapeutic or a drug? You are. So, but even here, okay, we think about building demand and improving the efficiency of customer acquisition. In a therapeutic context, you should think about the pharmaceutical and biotech companies that you might be partnering with, not necessarily the physicians that you want to write your prescription, okay? So it's a different mindset. We can talk one-on-one -on -one about that offline. But for those of you building kind of more tech or consumer products, um, you know, the angels and seed funds are really looking for, there's evidence, A, that your team can build your thing, whatever it is, and B, that there's some evidence of demand, okay? That there's some customer engagement or, or traction. Okay, and then that, that is, and that is growing. Okay, as so I'll, you know, it's, it's nice to say we have 10,000, 100,000, whatever the number is of users using our application or product or service, but the really interesting question is, well, how many were using it last month, how many the month before? And the answer was, well, it was 9,999 the month before and 9,998 the month before that. That's not a good trend. Okay, if you told me, that, well, we have 10,000 this month, last month we had 1,000, the month before that we have 100. I say, holy shit, wow, that's really explosive growth. I, I'm interested, at least. Doesn't mean I invest, but at least I'm interested. Okay, because th those kind of growth trends are what investors are looking for. When you're talking about the growth rate, I mean, at the beginning of the deal, uh, are you talking about an MVP, natural MVP? It depends. It, it depends. It, if, Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're here. You're in, in this yeah, phase. Yeah, but I'm, so I'm not over here yet. It doesn't sound like it, just based upon the little you just told me. Uh, so MVP is where? That's in this phase, right? You're, you're beginning to test or validate mm -hmm. that people want your thing, right? So here, to this is simply. In phase one, I'm saying, if this is my product, I'm saying, and I'm sorry if you've heard me say this before, you know, when do you get thirsty? How often do you get thirsty? Where do you look for solutions to satisfy your thirst? How much do you spend you know, to satisfy that thirst? What have you tried that you like? What have you tried that you don't like? Okay, That's testing my assumptions about your needs or problem. When I put up a web page and show this and see how many people click on it to learn more about it, I'm doing this. When I see how many people want to take an order for it, when I start doing maybe taste tests or I set up a, a pop-up tent in the park and try to sell it, okay, I'm seeking validation that people actually want my delicious beverage. Isn't it great, right? Okay, when I actually start trying to sell it at scale, or scale is relative, when I really start to try to sell it, that's here, okay? Um, so when, what, you know, the, the venture capital funds that people think of, the Union Square Ventures, the Sequoia Capital, Sparks, the uh, Kleiner Perkins of the world, is they, they're these groups that run these multi-million dollar funds, and they're really looking to, to help scale things, to really help grow a venture into the next stage. You've proven that people want it, and that you can build it, and now, and now you've begun to demonstrate that you can acquire companies economically and efficiently. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this will vary a little bit in enterprise versus consumer, online versus direct sales, but you just have to adapt these terms into that context. And we can help you think through that. Now, obviously, beyond that, there's other sources of capital, but you know, most people, when they think about venture capital, are probably talking about you know, what we call the, the, these, these phases here. 
Seed funds are just small venture capital funds, is a simple way to think about it. Um, some venture capital funds do seed investments. Okay, so th this is a continuum. It's not step one, two, three, four. Okay, it really is a continuum. And you'll see funds will bleed around. And as I said, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, then these people might be interested in funding you over here. But um, with the exception of Tim, I don't think there is a Mark Zuckerberg in the room. Um, um, but uh, with all due respect to the rest of you, maybe if once I get to know you. Um, but for, particularly for our first time entrepreneurs, I imagine most of you are, th this model is, is the way I want you to think about it. These aren't rules, these are guidelines, okay? Um, and at any point in time, we can help you um, understand kind of where you are and what's the appropriate form of capital. So when you're starting to think about pitching and developing a pitch deck and all that, is you, you probably should be somewhere in this phase, okay? So <clears throat> I want to talk now, what's the role of the pitch, okay? And that might seem obvious, and it is partially a rhetorical question, um, but I want to change the way you think about pitching, okay? So first, ask the question, why do we pitch? Why, why, why do you want to pitch? Well, I'm, we're thinking about fundraising. Oh, increase the capital Okay, what else? Any other reason? To get a second meeting. Okay, that, okay. You're, that, you're, you're a few slides ahead of me. Yes, but I'm, not just why do you do the first pitch, but why are we even pitching, period? Right, so most of you probably think it's like to raise money. Duh, Frank, right? Actually, that's not why you're pitching. Okay, the real reason you're pitching is to sell shares. You are a seller, not a buyer. You're not buying money. You're selling shares. Okay, and I want you to, to think about this, because it should change the way you think about pitching. Okay? You're trying to get them to buy a piece of your company, you know, either through convertible notes or preferred shares or a safe or a kiss or whatever mechanism it is. But you have to answer the question, same way what you do with your product. Who is my customer and why do they want to buy? What are, what are they going to get from buying my shares? Not why do I need the money? You do need to know that. You need to know why you need the money, what you're going to do with it, all that. But they care less about that and they care much more about how are they going to make money by investing in you. That's the first thing on their mind, not why you need it. Okay, so they you know, receive your executive summary or your pitch deck, and they think, you know, it doesn't matter how much you need the money. They're looking at this going, can we make a shit ton of money by investing in this company? If not, pass. Okay, and, and for those of you who read, uh, attended my first talk, you know, a, a typical venture fund will receive 1,000 to 2,000 pitches a year. And they're only gonna invest in five to 20, depending upon the velocity of the firm. Okay, so they're trying to knock things out so they can figure out which ones they want to spend more time on. Okay, so this, this is one of the most important things I'm going to tell you today. You may not think, believe me, but changing your mindset about why do they want to buy is much more important than why I need the money. Okay? So to put that another way, you need to raise money when you can raise it, not when you need it. Right? Just like you will sell your product to a customer when they have the need for it, not just when you want their money. I mean, you may be able to sell them just when you want their money, but probably it's going to be more when you can satisfy that need. Okay? So you want to think about raising the money when you're best positioned. Like, who saw the movie The Social Network? Right? When did he raise that round from Peter Thiel? Does anyone remember? You never saw Peter Thiel, but they talked about him. Well, I think it was 10, definitely on the West Coast by that point. Yeah, he was in, in I don't know exactly, he had like I think hundreds of thousands of users, 65% of whom were using it every day. So he was beginning to get some scale and he had amazing 
track. I mean, 60, if you come up with something that people, your customers will use, 65% of will use every day, that is crazy. That's incredible. Okay, so, you know, he didn't raise the money on an idea. Okay, no one really understood how big Facebook was going to be back then. I, mean, I don't think anyone was that prescient. But even so, okay, they had, they, and he was the first, he was a college student, just like most of you guys are. Okay, now the other role of the pitch, from, aside from giving you an opportunity to sell your shares, right, is that the investment pitch is also a proxy. Okay, it's a proxy for you and your ability to recruit talent and lead a team, to sell to customers, and to attract partners. Okay, because you don't, you, you as a first time entrepreneur don't have a long track record of, of, of uh, performance and neither does your venture. So they're looking for people who are gonna be able to do all these two things. Because if you can't convince them to part with $100,000, a half a million dollars, a million dollars, how are you gonna be able to do all those things? Okay, so that's why there's a lot of emphasis put on the pitch. Okay? Um, and so they're looking for, for you know, a, charismatic leader, a charismatic leader who's gonna be able to attract great people to be with them, right? No matter how good you are, it's never gonna be just about you. Every startup requires a team. Okay, um, and you're also going to have to sell to customers one way or the other. At a minimum, you're probably going to have to attract partners to, to work with you. Okay, so this pitch is really a proxy for that. So you need to tell a story and engage your audience, not just to, to drown them in facts. Okay, facts are important. Okay, um, but it's not just about your product or your tech. This is actually a classic mistake that entrepreneurs make. They do a pitch about their product. Okay? Product is important, but it's only one element of your business and what might make it a good investment. Um, and also remember, the pitch deck to this gentleman's point, right? The, your, pit, your first pitch is just that. It's your first pitch. Your goal of your first pitch is to get a second meeting. Okay? No one is going to invest based on your first pitch or based solely on it. Okay, you might actually win their heart that day, but you, it's going to take a little longer to win their mind and their wallet. Okay? So, put another way, you will not raise money solely on a great first pitch, but you definitely will not raise money on a bad first pitch. Okay, so the goal of that first meeting, as I said, is to get another meeting. Okay, you'll know that meeting went well if they schedule it, the next meeting, right there and then. They call their assistant and come in and try to schedule it. Or if there's an email waiting for you. Okay, now that said, just as you would probably intuit in a sales process, you don't wait for your customer to call you back. You do follow-up, right? You need to follow up with, with investors as well. But... For that first meeting, it's really, you, you know it's a good meeting when they're trying to schedule it. If they say, we're interested, we'll let you know, that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so, okay. Before the pitch, you need to ask yourself, are you really ready? Okay? And there's kind of two elements to this, right? There's all the kind of questions, and we'll go through... Um, these in a second that you need to know to anticipate the questions that they're going to ask and, and have some of them in your deck and some of them kind of in your head. Um, but you also need to answer the question of are we in a good position? Are we in the position to raise money? And I'm not going to really spend time on that for the rest of this talk, but that's how we can help you, okay? So if and when you think you're ready to raise money, even if you're not interested in getting money from our fund, coaching entrepreneurs and startups on the fundraising process is, is an important part of, of what we do and something we do every day. So in terms of the questions you need to ask, you need to you know, start with when are you going to raise, and, and if now, why now? Okay, How much are you going to raise? You'd be surprised how many pitch decks 
I see where they don't know how much money they're asking for. And that's not the investor's job to tell you how much money you need. They may want to tell you, they may give you advice to raise more or less. Okay, it's not uncommon that a first time entrepreneur may underestimate or overestimate for that matter, you know, their, their needs. Um, but you need to understand how much you're gonna raise and what are, you, what are you looking for? Actually, I'll come back to the quantum in a, in a, in a second. What are you looking for an investor? Okay, it's not just money. Okay, you're entering into a partnership with them. Okay, and a good investor, particularly a fund, angels might be different, but a fund is going to try to or want to provide some value add above and beyond their money. It might be, strate might be simply advice. It might be connections. There's a growing number of venture funds that offer uh, what some call platform or community services. Okay, these are kind of shared resources to help uh, a startup. It could be marketing uh, advice. It could be an in-house designer. It could be legal. It could be recruiting. It could be accounting and bookkeeping services. Okay, it could be pitch coaching for your next raise. Okay, there's a lot of funds are doing more and more and more of this. First round capital kind of made this a really big thing and now you have Lehrer doing this and Union Square Ventures. Two Sigma just hired a colleague of mine uh, to do this for their uh, fund. So what of those, which of those things are important to you? Okay? You also want to know about the individual as well. We'll talk more about that later. Okay? Coming back to the money, right? what are you going to spend the money on? Okay, now you don't necessarily need a, a five-year plan down to the penny on this, but you need to know in broad brush strokes Okay, well, we're going to spend it on, you know, hiring a business development person or hiring two more engineers, you know, uh, doing some initial uh, customer acquisition on Facebook or Google AdWords or, you know, whatever it is. You should have a good sense to be able to talk about it. It's not just a spreadsheet. You should be able to talk about why you want to spend that money. Okay, how long will that money last? Okay, now there's no real rule of thumb on this, but a lot of people, myself included, think 18 months is a good amount of time. Now, there's no magic to that other than to say it's going to take you a while for, to do something with that money and to turn it into something that's going to, if you're going to need to raise more money, that is, okay, uh, if that's what your business model dictates. If you don't need to raise more money, then don't. There's no law that says you have to raise a Series A after you raise a seed or that you have to raise a Series B after you raise a Series A. Okay, if you don't have to raise more money, don't. Um, but it, how long will it last, implying that it's going to run out? 12 months to do something meaningful in your business to attract the next class of investor and then six months to raise that round. And don't forget to build in some time to raise the next round. Okay, it will take, on average, three to six months to raise a round of capital. Okay, anything less than that, you're, you're really putting your, your company at risk. Okay, so you want to think about how much time do I need to get to a meaningful valuation inflection point to attract that next round of capital? Not just when I run out of money, but when do I get somewhere with that money? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then to build in some cushion to raise the next round. What will you accomplish with that money? Okay, and or to put it another way, what is that next round investor looking for? Okay, a seed investor might be looking for, you know, some demonstration of, of customer validation and that you can acquire customers. The next round, the Series A investor is going to be looking for the fact that you actually you know, accelerated your growth rate, okay, that you achieved certain revenue goals or targets, okay, what, whatever it is, you need to know what you're aiming for there, okay, so what will you accomplish with that money? Uh, yes. Um, so why, I don't know, but I see a lot of investors getting, you know, in stages, why don't, you know, um, investors stay with one project throughout the whole well, venture funds typically do. 
for their successful companies, but they also will cut their losses also. Okay, so a venture, angel investors and seed funds typically will invest in one or two rounds. That's just their, their business model. They invest small amounts of capital early. They buy early and hope to sell high. It's really not more complicated than that. Okay, the, the larger venture capital funds like Union Square, Sequoia, and so on, okay, they have larger funds and they need to put that to work. They, don't, they generally are not going to write a 10 or $20 million check you know, on the first date for the first round. Okay, they might invest anywhere from $1 million to $5 million. And you'll, you'll, you will find more, you will find less. Maybe that's the sweet spot. Um, but then they'll want to, if A, you need more money or, or you can make good use of that money, they will then follow on. That's the language that we use in, a, in the Series B round or a, and or a Series C round. And essentially what they'll do is they'll double down on their winners. Right? If your company sucks just because you need more money, they're not going to throw good money after bad, but they do want to throw more good money after the good. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry? No, that's Okay. Um, you want to know what your investors are looking for in you. Okay. What kind of companies do they like to invest in? What sectors, what stages, what criteria? What does traction or engagement mean to them? You talk to five different investors um, at, at the seed stage, you're going to get five different answers. Okay, so you need to know what they're looking for. Right? And if you've participated in many of our other workshops, you know, we talk about, and we'll talk more about this in a second, about doing customer <laughs> discovery, getting to understand your customer and what they're looking for before you try to sell them anything. Same thing with investors. You should really should treat this the same way. Okay, and as I'll, I'll say in, in, a, in a few more minutes, you, you should go out and find out what it is they're looking for before you actually begin the process of pitching. Okay, and that's an easy thing to do. And that's something that we help entrepreneurs do all the time. Right, Sarah's working on a startup before she's ready to raise money, she might come to me and I'll say, hey, let me introduce you to these three investors and I'll write to them. I'm, I'll say, Sarah's great, she's working on a new startup, can you give her some early feedback? Okay, most investors will say yes to that. If I, and, and without even really looking at her pitch. Okay, if I say, Sarah's trying to raise a two million Series A, they're gonna look at the pitch and they'll say either I am or I'm not interested. If I'm not interested, I don't wanna waste my time talking to Sarah, which is their loss, Sarah's lovely, but. Okay? Um, so you need to know what they're looking for, and, they're, and that's easy to do. Easier actually than it sounds. Okay, you wanna know why should they should invest in you? How are they gonna make money? Okay, because you know, investors talk a lot about being founder friendly and they're entrepreneurs themselves and they like sectors and they like trends and this and the other thing, but ultimately they are money managers just like mutual funds are or hedge funds. Okay, and they're, they have other people's money that they're investing and they have a legal obligation, it's called a fiduciary obligation to maximize that return. So they're looking at startups not that are cool or neat or people they like, but they're trying to figure out who can I make the most money with, because that's my job. That's what I'm being paid to do as an investor. Okay, so it's important that you understand their business model just as much as they understand yours. So how will they make money by investing in you? Okay, it doesn't mean you have to give them a detailed plan for who's gonna acquire you in five years, because that's crystal ball stuff. But you need to understand how is your business going to grow and ultimately become profitable and then be attracted to someone else to acquire, or maybe if you're one of the fortunate few, go public. And you, you need to have a sense of, and, and this gets harder, okay, but are you gonna need to raise more money? Are you just raising this one seed round and you're done? Or are you gonna need to raise more? Okay, so that goes back to this question, right? Uh, how long will it last? Um, if so, do you have a sense of how much you're gonna need to raise and when? Okay, it, it, it's not so much critical that you know this answer right, because there really is no way that you can know that answer. A lot's gonna change between the time you close on your seed round and the time you need to raise your next round. But if you think you can get cash flow positive and sustain your growth organically through that and you don't have to raise more money, good for you. You're gonna end up owning 75% of your company. 
at the end of the day as opposed to 35%. Good for you. Okay, and then similarly, you need to understand if you raise a seed round, then what are, what's the target that you're aiming for with the Series A investors, as we talked about, or if you raise your A, the, the Series B investors. Because there's often, an, even if the insiders, your existing investors, are going to follow on, as I talked about, they, they will often want a new lead investor to come in and set the price of your round. Okay, does that make sense? I know I'm talking jargon here, but if I... Please stop me if I'm not being clear. Question. Yes? Um, how much, when you're pre presenting, how much of what you're, like the way you're selling the material and everything, based on what you already have, and how much of it is projected? Um, so, you, you know, you should, and we'll t you'll see this as we kind of go through the sample deck in a few minutes, but you should have a good sense of how you're going, you know, what are the unit economics, how are you going to acquire customers, and, and your revenue model and demonstrate that you've been able to do it at some even small scale. Okay, and then what you're doing is you're extrapolating that rather than saying I have an idea, you know, think about the difference between I have an idea and now I have to take it on faith that you can build it, that your customers want it, that they're willing to pay for it, that you can acquire them as customers, right? So there's, there's that kind of, you know. Yeah, you that, have something, but then you're projecting on the, on the small scale Done, right? Exactly. So how okay is it to project? Like well, you have, to, you have to project at some okay. level. Um, but they're going to look much more at the evidence that you have than the projections. I mean, really, you know, I don't put a lot of stock. I, so I invest primarily in the seed stage. I don't put a seed stage. I don't put a lot of stock in a five-year financial model. What's mo more interesting to me is to see maybe three things, is what, you know, do the unit economics make sense? Meaning, if I sell one of these, you know, including my cost of goods, including my cost of sales, including my cost of marketing, can I make money on that? Okay, and if it's a physical good, I might assume that, okay, I can see the cost curve going down. If it's, you know, a virtual thing, then, you know, you know, what you, you know there's less economies of scale that you're going to get. Okay, um, so understand the unit economics are one. Two is um, understanding how big the market is, how big and how crowded the market is. Okay, um, I'm not really looking at you know what you're saying your your growth rate is um, as much as I'm saying, what's the end point? Is this a big enough market to sustain another company coming into it? Um, so is it big or is it growing really quickly or ideally both? And the third thing is, is that how can you and how are you acquiring customers? Okay, and that's why you know, having some evidence that you can do that is so important because this is the one thing that I find most entrepreneurs overlook. They, they're all about their product. But if you can't acquire customers, then it doesn't matter. And they're not going to, it's not about inventing a better mousetrap in the world, being a path to your door. That just doesn't happen. It's not if you build it, they will come. It's if you build it, how are you going to go out and get them and make them your customers? Does that make sense? Thank you. So if you can't really answer all of those questions, then you're really probably not ready to raise. Okay? Um, I got a pitch deck just this morning. Didn't mention how much money they were, they were trying to raise or what they were going to do with it. Okay, so that to me doesn't look like a pitch deck. Okay? Um, those are kind of obvious questions that any investor will have. Okay, so. If you don't have the answers to those questions, right, some of them, right, you might have to actually go out and talk to investors to understand the target you're aiming for. Some of these, you know, we can help you figure out on your own or, or point you in the right direction to figure them out. Okay. So we can help you with that, and we will do it when the time is right. If we really don't think you're ready to raise money, we don't want you to waste your time doing that. You know, we, we can't prevent you, and we're not going to prevent you from doing that. We'll offer advice, and you can take it or leave it. But raising funding is a very time-consuming 
and pretty much most entrepreneurs will tell you, near full-time job. That means that there's something else, probably a lot of other else's that they're not doing during that. Someone's trying to run the startup. Right, so it's, it's, it's exhaust, even when it goes well, it's an exhausting and very demanding process. Okay? Um, so some things to think about uh, as you think about different kinds of investors, you want to make sure that you're not wasting your time and other people's time. Okay? So you want to, just like you would think about targeting customers, you should target investors. You'd be amazed. I, I don't know if it's every day, but probably every other day, I get some random pitch from someone in the four corners of our planet asking me to invest in their company. And it very clearly, I don't know where they get my email from, but very clearly says on our website what the Innovation Venture Fund invested in. It's, only, it's you people. I, we invest in startups founded by NYU students, faculty, and researchers. That's it. And I get pitched constantly. They're wasting their time, and I don't even, I don't even read them. If, if I, I, the, the only thing I, I really care about is are they an NYU person? Otherwise, I'm not gonna, I don't, don't do personal investing right now, um, so I don't even waste my time. Okay? So anyway, some things to think about. Are, they, are you the right stage for that investor? Are they a seed? Right? Are they a Series A? Are they a Series C investor? Do they have a certain sector focus, and how do you fit with that? This one's a little bit harder, and we spoke about this in my last talk, but where are they in their fund life cycle? So most in... This is less true for angels, but more true for venture funds, is the funds have a finite life cycle. It's typically 10 years. Okay, if they're at the end of that fund, that means they need to return the capital to the investors at the end of the fund. So you wouldn't want to invest in a 10-year fund that's in year seven, because if you don't exit, meaning sell your company within three years, you're gonna have a mismatch with that investor and your expectations. So you can just ask them, you know, what, what fund are you investing out of? And if you really want to sound savvy, say, what vintage is it? Okay, that's like S California speak for what year was the fund formed. Okay, so a 2016 fund means they're probably just really getting into, or 2017 even more so, just starting to invest in that. Okay? Um, you want to know what they've been investing in recently. Okay, so these first thing, the first two, you can very easily, stage and sector focus, almost every fund is very clear on this on their website, okay? Uh, fund life cycle, some yes, some no, and you just, you might have to ask, but there's nothing wrong with asking. Recent activity, most are pretty good about updating their website. It might be hard to discern which ones they've invested in recently, but as I'll point to in a second, there's a lot of online resources that can help you know. You want to know, are their last five investments all in augmented reality or artificial intelligence, even though it says they're a mobile-focused website, but they haven't made a mobile investment in three years, right? That's important to know and may or may not be worth your time. Okay, do they lead or follow? Okay, does, it, does that language mean no? Okay, so in a round, in, of, in an investment round is often uh, what's called a syndicate, which is a fancy name for a group of investors. Okay, and so, and there's no average. It's a very broad distribution. There's been rounds that might have 20 angels in them or one that has two or three venture funds and everything else in between. Okay, typically someone is leading that round, meaning they're setting the, the terms. They're determining the price of the round, the, you know, the, uh, what type of anti-dilution protection there is, what type of liquidation preference there is, all the kind of nuts and bolts of the security that they're buying. Okay? They're setting the terms and negotiating that with the entrepreneur. And they may sign a term sheet with the entrepreneur that says, yes, we're willing to lead a $2 million round and we're going to put a million dollars in and we'll let you find the other million dollars, or we'll help you find the other million dollars, okay? The other people who fill in the gaps are the followers, the follow-on, or follow, uh, they follow someone else's lead, is the term that we use, okay? That makes sense? Okay, what's their investment pace? 
right? Some funds only invest in five years, some invest in 50 a year, some more. Okay, well that tells you something about the amount of, you know, also you have to look at it relative to the size of their team of the type of diligent, you know, someone that does 50 investments a year with three people, I don't want to say they're spraying and praying, but they're not spending three months doing exhaustive due diligence on you either. Okay, so you need to understand that. Um, uh, what's their typical check size? Okay, do they normally write $100,000 checks or $5 million checks? Um, where can you get warm intros to these people? Okay, sending in uh, your uh, executive summary or pitch deck or business plan or whatever to you know, investor at unionsquareventures.com might get looked at, but probably not. Okay, so some kind of warm intro. It could be through us, could be through a lawyer, your accountant, it could be a bank, it could be a friend, it could be another entrepreneur, but any kind of warm intro is better than something just coming in cold over the transom. Okay, it may not get you the meeting, but it will get you at least consideration, at least look at what you're email says. If it just comes in over the transom, it might not even get a look. Okay, we talked about value-added services. Um, if that's something important, what do they offer? Is that valuable to you? Do you need it? Are you going to take advantage of it? Okay, because maybe, you know, you might get competing term sheets from two different investors and one might have a, you know, they might have different valuations, but valuation alone is not the only thing to consider. The terms might come into play, as might the value-added services. Okay, is this an investor who's going to invest once and they're done with you? Or do they, are they looking to do follow-on investments? Okay, and this is a really important thing that a lot of people overlook. Do they have directly competitive portfolio companies, port, or portcos? Okay, most investors won't invest in something that they have as directly competitive. If you're creating a <laughs> seltzer startup and they already have a seltzer startup in their portfolio, they probably won't invest in, if they're ethical and most of them are, they won't even look at it, at yours. Okay, but don't send them something if you know it's, they're not going to uh, invest, because they might look at it just to know if this is something, oh, this is directly competitive. And once it's in front of them, they're looking at it already. So don't, you know, don't, don't send uh, it to them. It's worth a little bit of time and effort. So how can you figure out the answers to those kind of questions? Um, there's a bunch of online resources uh, that uh, all have a fair amount of information that's freely accessible. Uh, Crunchbase, CB Insights, and AngelList are the best ones. Um, Crunchbase probably has the most individual company uh, investor information, um, but you're not going to find necessarily the valuation. You might not find a complete list of investors, but it's, it's pretty good. I, I am on it probably every other day. CB Insights also has a lot of information. If you can get access to the subscription version of these through the library or something, you'll find there's a lot more information. AngelList, excuse me, uh, is an online kind of angel network. It's a way for angels to find deals, but they also have a lot of publicly available information that you can find about who invested in what, particularly when you're talking about angels. These are more valuable for funds. Um, as I mentioned, fund websites uh, usually are pretty good about updating it, but a lot of them blog and actually might have more information in their, more current information in their blog about a recent investment or their recent areas of interest that might be, then might be reflected in their kind of, mar, you know, boilerplate marketing uh, statements on the website. So it's important to, to look at that because things move relatively, I mean, a lot of funds in just in the last two years have been investing a ton in virtual reality, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence, and their websites may not have been updated to do that, but if you look at what they've invested in, you'd see that. Um, the news and media, and, and, you know, Crunchbase grew out of TechCrunch, if that was not obvious, um, and so that's how they feed a lot of their data. They look for funding announcements, and then they capture that in a more searchable database structure. 
but there's a lot of information out there. So uh, just if you Google a fund's name, you'll probably come across news stories uh, that may not be captured in some of these about their recent investments. Um, talking to people, talking to mentors and coaches uh, is a good way to get intelligence, right? If, you know, scan these sources, right? But then ask people who are in the know um, about this fund and what they invest in and, um, and so forth. You can learn a lot from that. Uh, other entrepreneurs. Okay, you can actually pick up the phone and call the CEO of any startup and see if they're willing to talk to you. Oh, I see Union Square Adventures invested in you. Can I just talk to you about your experience working with them, how it's been? You might be surprised uh, how many might be willing to talk to you about that. Uh, as I mentioned, your lawyers, accountants, banks. Uh, it's another reason to go with someone who is very active in the startup space. Okay, JP Morgan um, and uh, you know, Skadden Arps and um, Ernst & Young might be the best bank, the best law firm, and the best accounting firm on the planet, but they tend to deal with big companies. You want people who specialize in startups and small companies. So going with um, Silicon Valley Bank, um, Fenwick and & West, and uh, Eisner Amper might better serve you Right, because they're going to be wired into the startup community, know the investors, know the players. And then, of course, there's our team. And this is a big part of what we do. OK, so this is a lot of information that you're going to need to keep track of. So it pays to be organized. OK, it could be as simple as a, a, you know, an Excel doc. But there's no way you're going to be able to keep track of this all, your head, in, all in your head. Particularly once you start mailing people, emailing people, and you know, is it time to pester them and follow up? Um, who, am I, who have I scheduled meetings with? So being organized will pay dividends to you. Okay, you don't have to necessarily use an, an expensive tool, um, but it, it will help. All right, so let's talk about the elements of a good pitch. So um, there is no universally true uh, approach, right? As you're in different stages, different things will be more or less important. Um, I thought of this deck, uh, this outline that I'm going to share as what would be appropriate for a seed stage fund, a seed stage raise, fundraise rather. Um, and so I'm going to go through this very quickly, and then we'll look at a deck that kind of follows this model more or less. OK? So start with a slide that has your name or logo on it, explains in one sentence what you do. OK? If you don't know what a business thesis is, it describes what you make, who's it for, and why they care. OK? So we make the most economical drinks for very thirsty people. Okay, that's kind of lame, but you get my point. As opposed to just saying beverage. Okay, it explains who it's for and what your value is to them. Okay? And, and this is just to get that, explain who you are. It's a good opportunity to introduce yourself and have that sit on the screen while you're, while you're uh, making introductions. Okay? I really like to start with the problem. Okay, before you even get because you've already set the stage of a little bit. You gave them a tease of what your solution is with your business thesis. Okay, now we talk about what's the problem that you're solving and who you're solving it for. Okay, so this sets up the scope of the problem and who has it and who you're focusing on. Okay, then you can introduce your solution. Okay, and you, you should try to focus on quantifiable benefits. Okay, and that the, as you framed the problem, okay, the solutions should naturally address them. Okay? But now you're, you should be demonstrating some evidence or data about how you, you save people time, how much time. You save people money, how much money. Okay? And then you talk about what your product is, how it works, and evidence that it does that. Okay? Well, you'll see this in the example. You also need to talk about how you make money. Okay, um, what's your revenue model? Are you selling advertising? Are you selling a subscription? 
right? Are you, are you selling a physical good? Okay? How big of a market are you addressing? And how much, you know, to kind of get them excited that how much it's money... It's 5 o'clock. Thank you. How much money you could make if you actually dominate that market, right? Who's the competition and why is your solution better? Okay, and that should tie back to the problem that you're solving, right? Because you should be presenting a problem that is not solved in the marketplace, right? So it's not everything that, that your product does. What's the most compelling way that you're better or different than your customers in a way that you've already established that they care about. Okay, how are you going to acquire and retain customers? Hopefully to do it profitably and at scale. Okay, the unit economics answers the question of if I'm selling it for X, how much I could potentially make on each sale of that product or service. And then some evidence of traction, proof that customers or users love your product. Okay, this is the validation of everything else that you've just said so far. Who's the team and why do you have the experience and or expertise to own this opportunity? Okay. What are you going to do with the money? What are you going to accomplish? How long is it going to last? And then some summary slide that captures the key things that you want them to remember. And this is a slide that I recommend you don't ever talk to, but you just leave up there while you're doing Q&A. Okay? So let's go through uh, an example of this outline. And by the way, these, yes? Yes. Uh, Sarah will send them out, or send out a link to it, to every, uh, everyone who RSVP'd. Uh, for this, and uh, it'll also be available on, I think there already is a version of, from last semester already on SlideShare that is 99% of, of this deck. Okay, so here's the pitch deck for Gleamer. This is not real, this was put together by the pitchdeckcoach.com. Um, I think there's a lot of really good things about it, but I think there's some things that could be improved, and it roughly follows that outline I just shared with you. So uh, Uber is, uh, Gleamer rather, is Uber for mobile auto details. Get an affordable professional auto detail wherever you are, where, whenever you want. Okay, so that, that's good as, as an intro. It's pretty clear on what they do, okay? Um, I would say it's a little bit broad on who their customer is, but that, that's okay for this slide. You might not want to get into too much detail. My beef with this one is this, this notion of Uber for, or Airbnb for, or Amazon for is overdone. And it might mean one thing to you. It probably means other things to an investor who might actually be much more familiar with Uber's business model than you are. And it might connotate things that you don't necessarily mean to connotate or connote or whatever. Um, so I just like use plain English, mobile auto detailing. Everyone know what detailing is, by the way? So this is a, okay, I probably should explain this. Yeah, it's kind of high-end uh, cleaning. So when you get someone to, you know, clean and wax your car by hand. So kind of like if you ever bought a used car from a dealer, okay, that car was detailed before you bought it. So it looks like it's as close to brand new as, as you can. And wealthy people get this done all the time. So they're saying this is a business that you could go to an app, say, I want my car detailed on Tuesday at you know, 2 p.m. at this address. Okay, okay, makes sense. Particularly in Silicon Valley, this might make a lot more sense than it does in New York City. Okay, so just avoid these kind of pithy analogies. Because um, there's, while th this is on demand, right, Uber is, is maybe different, okay? Um, this is actually good in the sense that it, it articulates the problem. I'd rather see it more specific and quantified. Okay? Busy consumers, essentially is talking about everybody. I really want to know what is, who is that busy consumer? <coughs> right? 
you're all busy consumers, but I don't think you're their market. If you're living in New York City and you don't own a car. Okay, now maybe it's obvious we're talking about car owners here, right? But maybe it's in you know, major suburbs, or maybe it's people who have you know, above $100,000 incomes. The more specific you can be, okay, it also shows that you've done your research. Okay, you're not trying to be all things to all people. But quantify the problem, right? How much time are they wasting doing uh, this the existing way? And I'd say same thing here. So they're like, like Uber, kind of, they are a marketplace, right? You have the consu busy consumers and mobile auto detailers. They're looking for more business and it's expensive and time consuming to do it. And for them, it's hard to find someone to do it at their home or office. Okay, so with Gleamer, I could tap of, a, of a, my thumb, I could get someone there. So if you told me that they're spending, you know, auto detailers are spending $50 for every customer, and you could bring that down to 20, well, that just sounds like a no-brainer then. Okay, but too much money could mean anything. Okay, and again, it reflects your knowledge and understanding of the market and also sets up your value proposition. Right? If they, if they only have to pay $5 by using Gleamer versus the $50 that they have to use by taking out ads in the newspaper or whatever it is, right? 12K per year doesn't really tell me much. It doesn't tell me enough that that's too much. Too much for what business run rate? Okay? Uh, yes? Sorry, about the first slide. Uh, how, um, it's probably something that we would use from then on. For what? For, for that, your business for the, thesis? For the thesis, yeah. Like what you could tweet. Okay. I mean, it doesn't have to literally be 140 characters, but like that's roughly the length. Right. And right, if it's a paragraph. I mean, generally, you want to be careful. One rule of slides is the more text you put on a slide, the more time they spend reading it and the less time they spend listening to you. And you're probably going to start talking the second that slide goes up there. And if they have to spend 30 seconds reading the slide, they probably really didn't hear the first 30 seconds of what you said. They heard you going wah, 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 but they really didn't internalize what you said. You want, I mean, you know, have you ever seen um, the way Steve Jobs presented? He'd have one picture or one word on a slide. Okay, now we're not all Steve Jobs. I certainly am not. Okay, and maybe you are, maybe you're not. Okay, the less words you can have on your slide, the more they're listening to you. And you use the slide to reinforce a key point or as a visual cue for you. Okay, so less is more is a way to think about it. One more question. Um, yep. We don't want to, as you said, like, cram every single detail that we have onto one slide. So what if there were more than one sort of uh, Well, on the intro slide, you just, it's a teaser, right? You, you, you need to then jump in and set up the problem and explain your solution. Don't try to tell them everything on the first slide. Okay, keep it high level. And you really don't want them to start asking you questions about it. You want to get through that slide so you can get to this stuff. Does that make sense? OK. Go ahead. It is a lot. It is a lot. No, I, I agree. It is a lot of text. Um, some people might just show a picture of a frustrated consumer and a, and a mobile detailer, you know, putting an ad in the newspaper. It's like, I don't know uh, what visual would work. And then you could talk to this. It depends on, how, on your presentation style and what you're comfortable with. Now, one secret of PowerPoint and Keynote is the fact that you can have a notes field. Okay, and so I really don't have much in the way of notes here, but this is the view that I'm looking at right now. Okay, and there's the slide that's up here. Okay, here's the slide that's up next. And I could have all the notes, I could have a script there. Okay, or I could just have, you know, the key talking points. I could have this text in there and just a picture. Right? Um, now, that requires more practice and it's harder to do, but if you can do it, those can be awesome pitches. 
But you also need to know investors, just like you're not letting me get through my presentation. No invest, that's a joke. Um, no investor is going to let you go through your pitch uninterrupted. Okay, so you, you need, it, it's, it's good to have a script and be well rehearsed, but you also got to be able to dance on demand. That, great question. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a good practice to have. Well, A, I would generally send less information in you know, a teaser deck. Um, not because they're going to do anything different with it, but you, know, you, you just want to get them interested with that teaser deck, right? What you might send in an email or what you might ask a friend or colleague to forward on your behalf. Uh, but yeah, that needs to stand on its own. Yeah, if you just have a bunch of pictures, they're going to be like, what the? Right? Um, thanks. Uh, so you don't have to do that. It depends on what deck you actually want to present with. I'm, I don't want to go so far as to tell you only have pictures, because I think that is, is the pendulum maybe swinging too far. But I will say, you know, think about the less words you can have on the slide, the better. Does that make sense? Would yep. you say it would be a good idea to set an example of one consumer using the service for, for, for the pro to just display, the, like, present the problem? Yeah. Is that OK to do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, if this was something that helped bring clean water to, you know, children in South America, you could have a picture of a thirsty South American child, you know, um, or a diseased pool of water, right? Um, I mean, I'm serious. And then, and then you talk to it. And you say, you know, every year 10,000 people in Bolivia die from dirty drinking water. Okay? Right? That's, that's powerful. And then the, you have an image that, that backs it up. Not everyone can deliver that kind of pitch. Okay? Um, but if you can, yeah, that can be very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the question that this, yeah. So you can do that. You don't have to do that, but you can. I, I, I do think it's a good idea to have the one you send shorter and one that stands on its own. Um, OK. So this is the solution slide. This is OK um, in that I like how it frames the benefits to the two, they have a, what's called a multi-sided market, right? They have two different customer sets, like LinkedIn does, right? Or face, uh, Facebook or Google. All are multi-sided markets, right? We all use Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, but none of us pay for it, right? They all rely on advertisers, so that's their customer, right? And where, where their users, so where their consumers and their advertisers, or consumers and detailers in this example. So each of them have different benefits. Now, the way that they position this, the benefits almost look the same. So I would have liked to have them show me the money, right? What does saving time and money trans? How much money are they going to save me? How much time are they going to save me? The average, you know, if you set up the problem that normally takes two hours in our research for a customer or a consumer to find a detailer, and we can help them do it in five seconds with Gleamer, right? That's saving them a lot of time. If they can get it at a lower cost because there's, you know, kind of your, they're competing for your business, right? If I just go to the car wash and, you know, and I'm there and I say, how much does it cost to detail my car? They know I'm there. They don't have competition, right? Because I'm less likely, because I'm lazy to leave, right? So they may charge me $80. On, a, on an online marketplace, I bet you the price is lower, okay? And same thing for the detailers. How much time are you going to save them? How much money are you going to save them on advertising? Okay, so you need to know how much time and money your customers are spending to show, knowing what you're, with, with the economics of your business, how much you can save them. Okay, that's a compelling and quantifiable value proposition. Okay, now notice the difference between the solution and the product. 
Right? The product talks about the product. The solution talks about the benefits. Okay, so don't get into the weeds of what your product does. Okay, and lose them on that. First lead with what are your benefits, and then show with amazing screenshots how your product works. Now, I'll anticipate someone's questions. What about showing a live demo? Mm -hmm. Live demos are great, but they crash you know, 34.6% of the time, even though they worked the past 100 times. So it's always good. And most VCs won't totally ding you on that. There's, you know, there's jokes about the demo gods, right? Um, did, you, did you pray to the demo gods before you walked into the pitch? Um, so it's good to be able to have something like this, and then you could show a live demo or show a video. Um, but you should have multiple things, in, right? If, if you are a live mobile app or website, you should be able to just pull it up. Mm -hmm. And you will likely be asked to. Okay, but it's also good to have something like this so you could first kind of, you know, show quickly what it is and how it works. And you can imagine, you know, just on the little you know about this product, what could be on the, you know, you browse available detailers, compare and review prices, select book and pay, right? Boom, boom, boom. You can explain the flow of how it works really quickly and, you know, show what some of the features are. Maybe you don't even have to do a live demo. Maybe they've already downloaded your app already if you're in the market or they visited your website. It's probably, you should assume that they have if you're live. Okay. Um, but I'll say the two patents pending, like, right, you don't have to have to have, have an intellectual property slide, but if you did have patents pending, okay, you can drop that in, but be prepared to talk about it. You should be prepared to talk about anything that you put on the slides, okay? So um, this revenue model talks about their unit economics, right? We charge detailers a 15% transaction fee, right? So the de on a $75 job, the detailer gets $63.75, Gleaver gets $11.25, okay? And it explains a little bit more about how it works here. Um, What's missing from this for me is the unit economic dimension of this, of how much does it cost them to deliver each customer, right? What was their, their cost of acquiring that customer? And do they have, now it's probably very low for a business like this, you know, there's the marginal cost of, of more people using your app is pretty low, right? You get really good economies of scale that way. Uh, but if there were some physical, or cost, what are they on a per unit basis, all right? So, you know, you don't have to be profitable at this early stage, but I want to know, are you or are you not? Um, so in this deck, as you'll see in a second, there's two ways of looking at the market. This is uh, what we would call a top-down way of looking at the market, right? So the entire, in this case, the entire uh, auto detailing market is a $36 billion market. And you can see that, that comes from some reputable source. Okay, this isn't school, but you, you know, if you are quoting someone else's data, it's good to help establish your credibility if Gartner Group said there's a $36 billion market uh, for auto detailing in the US. Okay, um, now that's the total addressable market. Their serviceable addressable market, in this case, is what they've called mobile auto detailing. Okay, mobile meaning the people that actually go and do it at your location. Right, so that's, those are the people who are the potential or the detailers that are the, the potential uh, for that market. Okay, now they did something that I think is a little unconventional here. They then just took 15% of this number and they said that's their market opportunity. That's kind of making stuff up. What I would rather have seen was then for the mobile, okay, what percentage of this is in the target market that they're going after? Maybe they're just starting out in California, right? Because people care more about their cars. Everyone drives everywhere, even in LA, even in the cities people drive, right? So it's a different 
different lifestyle. And so maybe their initial market opportunity might just be California, which might be $1 billion market. Okay, but then ultimately if they grow, this is the, the market that they could, they could ultimately go after. Now that's a top-down way of looking at it. This is what's called a bottoms-up way of, of, of building your market opportunity. Okay, there's 270 million autos on the road. One-third of those get detailed every year. One-third of those are mobile. They cite the sources for those. Um, the people who get mobile detailing get it done on average six times a year. Total mobile detailers per year means it's $180 million, 180 million detailings per year in the U.S. at an average price of $75. That's a $14 billion market, and again, they're making this 15% leap. I'd rather see them segmented by the customers that fit into their target profile than just by saying the 15% is arbitrary. Okay, don't fall into that trap, and you'll, it, it actually annoys investors because they hear it so often. If we just get 1% of the market, we're a billion dollar business. Okay, well how are you gonna get that 1%? It sounds like just 1%, but how are you gonna get that 1%? Okay, so this was good up until that point. Um, so say, you know, and then it was, well then, you know, 10% uh, of these are in California and that's a $1.4 million market because we're focusing on California. It doesn't have to be geographic, but I'm just giving you uh, uh, some kind of example. So that was nice, save that. Now, competition is a, is a tricky one, yes? Um, I think doing it more from this bottoms up, well, I don't think you can estimate what your market share is going to be in five years. So you want to suggest that it's a big enough market that you can, and then demonstrate how you're going to get a meaningful piece of it, then by just saying, we're going to get 10%. No, I don't think you do. I don't, I don't. It's crystal ball, yeah. It's, it's. Now, if you can show, because you've already had 100,000 customers and your average cost of acquiring customers was $5 per unit, right? And, well, and, and we're going to be, you know, we were able to get that down from 10 to $5 and we believe we can get it to four. And so now we're going to spend $4 million on acquiring cu customers, which is going to get us Right, you can start to piece together the puzzle for them, but still, but you know, the further you extrapolate it out, the less meaningful the numbers are. But that's why having some of that that traction up front is really important because then it, it helps validate the kind of the front end of your funnel, your growth funnel. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's generally two ways, and I think I only show one here that. Uh, people generally present competition. There's the two by two matrix, as you see here, and then there's what I call the consumer reports model. Does everyone know what consumer reports, right, with the, the circles and the half circles, right? And so you'll see down one side there will be some long list of features that your customers value, and then there'll be some list of competitors across the top, and then they'll have checks or full circles, half circles, empty circles, or something like that on and you know, your company always checks every box fully and everyone else sucks. Okay, same thing here. In this one, everyone else sucks and you're over here and up and to the right. Just don't overstate, there's no, no one is better than the other. Just make sure that A, you're really doing this, if, whether it's two by two or consumer reports, on the dimensions that really matter to your customers. And you probably should have done a good job of establishing that early in your presentation when you stated what the problem was and why your solution solved it, okay? Um, but two, don't overplay your hand here. Okay, by showing something like this with no one else in this quadrant and you all the way up here and everyone else way down here, you're not really as credible as, as you might think, yep. How do you approach that on the competition side? 
Um, good question. Um, so that's harder to probably do in a two by two. Maybe that fits better into the consumer report style. You know, maybe you have some of the criteria that are for the consumer, some that are for the detailer. Um, you know, the other thing, is, actually I'm glad I almost forgot this, is don't fall into the trap of only comparing yourself to people who are using the same technology approach as you. Okay, so who are Gleamer's competition? Uh, no, 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 I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, for the auto detailers. For the auto detailers. But no, I mean, how as a consumer might I learn about a detailer? Right, so what, what tools are the detailers using to advertise to their customers? Let me ask it more bluntly. Google, right, phone book, newspapers, right? right? So it's not all technology based. Some of it might be real old school stuff too. It could be, you know, posters on, um, on telephone poles, right? So make sure, and, and if that's working for them, then they're, then they're your competition. Okay, to give an example I've used in, in other contexts, we had a team that was working on a hemostatic gel. Okay, for those besides Raj, that means a, something that actually stops bleeding, a gel derived from plants that stops bleeding. Actually, it's pretty amazing stuff. It really works, and it works in three seconds, which is amazing. Okay, when I asked them about their competition, this is like, they're a successful company now. When I asked them about their competition like six years ago, they said, oh, we don't have any. I'm like, really? I'm like, so if I went to the hospital, there's just people bleeding all over the place? So they have no way to stop bleeding? No. Who was their competition? Band-aids or gauze and pressure. Okay, they were defining themselves by, you know, gels and foams. Turns out there were other gels and foams that they didn't know about at the time, but putting that aside, okay, what's the challenge for them with gauze and pressure and band-aids? It's cheap. It's really cheap. And even the janitor knows how to do it. You don't have to be a doctor to know how to stop bleeding, right? If your son or daughter or friend got a cut, you know what, we all know what to do. Okay, so you don't need their hemostatic gel for first aid, or, you know, because it's not free. And I don't know what the cost is, but if it was $5 per application, well, you're not putting that on to stop so a little cut here, right? So they were, think about how your customer solves the problem, not what is the technical approach that you're using. All right. Um, so this is the weakest slide in the whole presentation because this talks about how they are going to acquire their customers but doesn't give me any sense that they actually are doing it or know how to do it, right? So this is the weakest slide in the whole thing. I could have come up with this slide for this business and you wouldn't know the difference. And as you'll see in the next slide, this is a, a company with real traction, okay, um, right, that this just makes it sound like they don't know what they're talking about for marketing. So this next, the following slide is more credible. So I want to know what you're using, to, what you're doing today, what's working, what you've tried, maybe tell me about what didn't work or what you've learned along the way, what techniques you're using, how many leads they're generating, make it real, make it tangible. Okay, don't just say, oh yeah, we're going to advertise and we're, doing, we're going to do PR. Tell me what you've done and what's working. Okay, quantify it to the extent you can. Okay, so this, this deck I like, um, but tables like this are really hard to process. Charts like this are great. Okay, the best deck I've, I've ever seen, I don't, I can't find it for the life of me, but it was one of the companies we invested in called Numberfire. And um, not so much important what they, they did, but they showed um, four charts on one page. Had one chart that showed visits to their website, going up and to the right like this. They had another site, uh, another chart that showed, I'm kind of making this up, but you'll, Go, go with me, you know, like time on site, like number of page visits per visit, and that kept going up and to the right. 
Okay, and then they had um, you know, time between visit, and that was going down. Right? And then they had cost of acquiring customer, and that's going down. Okay, so they, like, everything was trending in the right direction. That got me excited. It goes back to what I talked about before. If you said you had 10,000 users today and 999 a month ago, not very interesting. You had 1,000 a month ago, that's very interesting. So how can you paint a picture that there's a trend? And, and by the way, if you don't have a slide like this, then your presentation comes off like an idea. And you don't want that. Okay? And if you can't tell a story like this, then you're going to have a hard time raising money, to be honest with you. Okay? So more of these, less of the, you know, show it in a chart. The charts are, are you know, are, are great at, at telling a story. Um, <coughs> I, for those of you who don't know, LTV is lifetime value. Um, CAC, customer, uh, cost of acquiring a customer. Your LTV needs to be greater than your CAC, right? The amount of money you can extract from a customer must be more than the amount you spend to acquire them. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So there's no magic number. Five, a five to one ratio might be very good in this industry. So this is nice, but it's unsubstantiated. So either be prepared to talk to that in detail or have backup data. Actually, that's a, a, a good point to make, is you can't tell them everything in your initial pitch deck, OK? So having 8 to 12 slides is, I think, a really nice number to, to try to aim for. You could have 237 backup slides, as long as you're adept at, in PowerPoint of getting to those backup. You know, so someone asks you for more information about your competition or your patent. Oh, one second, and you pull up your slide which talks about the claims in your patent or whatever it is, right? Whatever that, it, you can have a million backup slides. Okay, don't try to tell them everything because you want the Q&A to be meaty. Okay, uh, a good team slide is good. You shouldn't have, you know, paragraphs of biography. Right? Um, something like this or the logos of the companies you work for. Schools aren't that important, but to the extent that um, you, know, you can use that as a way to connect with someone. You know, you know there's an NYU alum in the audience. Well, then you should definitely put your NYU logo in your slide deck. Okay? It could just be a conversation starter, a way for that one person in the audience to feel a little bit of a, of a shared connection with you. Tim, you had a question? Yeah, on that previous point, in terms of, uh, so when you have a presentation, you have your rhythm and you sort of the story to tell, and obviously you said investors so are going to interject and ask questions. Would you imagine a, would be best to like answer the question and dive into the slide deck and go off your story, or kind of just answer the question and then get back to your story? It depends. Is the truth. It's hard to generalize about that. Um, you'll get more depth at this with practice, and it really depends on, you know, it's, it's okay to say, can you hold that question? I'm going to get to it in a few slides. And maybe they say okay, and if they, they might say no. I said, no, I really want to talk about that right now. Then you deal with it, right? I mean, remember, if, if, you were trying to, if they were a customer and you're trying to sell them a product, you, the customer is always right, right? So that, that mindset, should, you should try to work with that here. You know, they're, they're, most people aren't going to be really rude to you, but sometimes they really have something to them that is a burning question or issue that they want to discuss. Some people are really pushy. That's just the way they are. Some people are like, yeah, sure, whatever, you know. So you, you got to kind of read your audience in your room but be flexible and adaptable. Okay, so I don't really, I'm not a big fan of putting advisors up on it. It makes your team actually look bigger than it is. And if you're a small company, you actually don't want to make it look like you have a huge team and a huge burn rate. Okay, um, so I wouldn't put the most, you can talk about who these people are. Most investors know that most advisors are window dressing, and they see through that. 
if you're going to put, you know, Sue Smead's name on here, you better be able to talk to when was the last time you spoke to Sue and how she's helped you. And if it was three to six months ago, then she's really not an advisor. Okay. Um, I thought this was actually a nice touch saying, you know, after we raise this round, the first person we're hiring is the director of customer service. Or right now, we're trying to hire a director of our customer service. Do you know anybody? I mean, you don't have to ask them for help, but it's, it, it shows you're being honest and real about, you, you, you know what your needs are. So I, li I like that in this one. Um, so this is, this is decent. This explains how they got to where they are right now. They bootstrapped for the first six months. They're raising a two million Series A. Um, they're targeting to close. Okay, that's nice. I don't know if I really care about that, but um, the fact they have 600,000 committed uh, is good. Be careful, as I'll come back to you on that point, uh, be careful about overstating that. Yeah? Real quick on that team play. Uh, so what if that situation with the TBH is a real actual co-founder? Would, would you even say you should pitch? Because I mean, I know a founder that uh, is in a competition and they have a situation. Uh, so well, then they're not a co-founder. If the company's already founded and they're not there, then they're not a co-founder. So they've executed a, a lot, but now they need someone, you know, full-time technical. Okay. You still would say it's a kind of higher rate. Well, if you don't have the technical person that you need to execute on your business, you have a problem. A lot of investors, if there's not a full-time CTO, VP of engineering, whatever you want to call it, on the team, they don't even want to look at it. Um, that's a, we can talk about that more. Um, so. <laughs> I like this. Kind of talks about the high-level goals of what they're going to do with the money. Okay, that sounds ambitious, but it's I, I, I rather see that than just say we're raising two million dollars to do what. Okay, I'd like to know how long that's going to last. Kind of that cues the conversation of whether or not they're going to need to raise more money. And then I end with this slide. I don't have to go through it. It sometimes I find is awkward to go through something like this, but you just leave this up there and then you say any questions, right? And this kind of, the highlights are up there and while they're thinking or while you're talking, maybe they're reading that and it reinforces your most salient points of your pitch. Okay? So that's, that was 13 slides. Remember there were two market slides. I would have had one. Um, now, uh, let, me, uh, let me comment on this. We can come back to this if you want by going through some of my pet peeves. Okay, so the, there's a spectrum that entrepreneurs like to dance on, right? Everyone, when you're pitching, wants to accentuate the positive, okay? And you should, and that's good, okay? But you also want to be honest, okay? And you don't want to be caught stretching the truth, let alone exaggerating, and definitely never lie and obfuscate. Okay, because so you're trying to build trust with your investor. And this may be the first time you've ever raised money. This may be the thousandth pitch they've ever seen, and the 50th or 100th time that they're going to invest in a startup. They know the things to look for. They know the games that entrepreneurs play. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, but be careful going too far in this direction, okay? Um, because it, it will come back to haunt you. And, and these, are, these are real things that have been put into email or said to my face, okay? We're signing a huge contract next week, okay? Unless it's signed, you're not signing a huge contract next week, okay? Because you're with all due respect, a first-time, inexperienced entrepreneur, these big companies drag entrepreneurs through the mud without even meaning to do so. Okay, it's always going to take longer. I, I've never heard anyone say, we're signing a contract next week, that actually signed it next week. It always takes longer. So be careful of, of overstating that. You know, we're in over 500 accounts already. Okay, you've sold to 500 accounts. You've demoed to. Okay, that was a, a gross overstatement. 
We're increasing our top of funnel sales leads by 10x. That sounds like great jargon, but they actually know what the jargon means. And if they start asking you questions, you've got to be able to, to back up data like that. Okay? Really? How are you doing that? How much is it costing you? What's your cost per lead? Really? How many? You, so you, you increase by 10x? So you have how many are in the funnel right now? 1,000? So you had 100 last month? Okay, you gotta be able to back that up. Okay, they're not just gonna let things like that fly. And part of the interrogation and back and forth is, a is validating your credibility. Right? Um, this one I hate. When you start doing due diligence and they tell you other investors aren't asking for this information, well, I am. And I need that to get to my investment decision. Okay? Now, if I'm asking you for something that is really going to require a ton of work, okay, maybe. But, then, but that, should, that should not be the way that you answer that question. I guess it's safe to say that most startups are like in a David and Goliath kind of situation. So how do you go around that? You know, because I'm, I'm sure somewhere, somewhere else, someone is building the next Facebook, for example. Well, you see, you tell that so... If, if, the, if you're saying this to me, okay, no, that's then you're, no, no, but then you're here. You're obfuscating. That's what I think. I'm like, they have, why won't they give me this information? Okay, that's, that's what I infer from that. Okay, um, this is great, but it better be true. Okay, to say that people are funding means that there's money, and I've, I've been told this line too many times to count to say that other people are already fine. People try to, you know, to, to, to break the log jam, break the ice, get the, the money flowing. Because often, once one investor funds, then the other people will start to fund. And if I know who some of those other angels are, I'm going to pick up the phone and call them and ask them about the company. And when they tell me that they haven't, they haven't funded yet, then I, you, just, you just lied to me. Okay, don't be caught in that trap. Our round is almost fully subscribed. Okay, that's great if it's true. Don't say that if it's not, because next week I'll know that it's not true, or is. Okay, we have three patents. That statement says to me patents granted. That doesn't mean provisional patents, it doesn't mean patent applications. Okay, and then our CTO is full time. That's another great one. Right, meaning they're, they're recruiting a CTO who's, you know, who took a look at their code and said it's crap and said, when you're funded, I'll hire you. Uh, you can hire me. Yeah? You mentioned earlier uh, we're looking to invalidate. Do you find, like, across your experience of or talking to VCs, are they looking to, like, so they're starting at 100, I want to fund this, and then, like, try not to hit you? Or are they suddenly no. here and they're like, I want to get interested? No, but, I mean, they're not... They're not trying to knock you out, but they're you know, doing their diligence and they want to make sure, is this person a straight shooter? Do they tell the truth? You know, are they going to tell me what's wrong with the business now? Because when the shit hits the fan a year from now and sales are 50% off, are they going to obfuscate that too? So it's, it's, it's beginning to test how you behave. You know, so the, the reason why I say these are lies entrepreneurs tell is because these things will come back to haunt you. They will bite you in the ass. This is the best image I could come up with that wasn't a medical image of someone getting, who was bit in the ass. And I didn't want to share that. So hopefully that scares you a little bit. But some of these can be used to grab attention and then explain, right? If it's true. Oh, if it's true, yeah. It's all good. Then if it's true, it's all good. Right? But you better be able to substantiate every single one of those. Right? If you say other angels are funding ready, I, then I say who, and you go, oh, uh, well, uh. <coughs> okay. So another pet peeve is off-target pitches. I kind of already substantiated that one. Um, right? Don't waste my time sending me a pitch. And, and you know, particularly you know, in my role here at NYU, if someone sends me an off-target pitch, no matter how interesting it is, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to, to really look at it or read it, and I'm not going to refer it to someone else, just because 
I have nothing better to do with my time than read random pitches that have nothing to do with what I'm looking for to help someone else make money. It's just not what I'm going to do. So don't waste my time. Don't pitch me on ideas. Okay, this is why that demonstrating that you have traction is so important. And the, the disproportionate number of pitches that angels and seed investors see probably are really at the idea or advanced idea stage. And you need to differentiate yourself from them. So make sure you do. Um, I'll let you read these for a second. But these things matter. Okay, you know, typos, um, poor grammar, I love this one. Um, you know, being really long-winded um, or using a lot of cliches or a lot of jargon. You know, you might have a, you know, a PhD in molecular biology, but, you know, don't assume that everyone who's reading your plan does. Okay, there's, there's a, a balance between dumbing it down so much and sounding like you don't know your, don't know your shit, but um, you need to strike that balance. Now, on this last point about being long-winded, right, avoid the big wind-up. I mean, I just got a pitch deck this morning that they didn't describe what they did until slide 12. They spent 11 slides defining the problem. And the, you know, and it was a beautiful deck. It was really, it was a gorgeous deck. Nice graphics and photography and typography. But it was like, you know, like if slide five, I'm like, what the hell do they do? Right? So, you know, you want to kind of explain the problem or challenge that you're addressing really quickly and get to your solution. Okay? Um, also, this is my way of saying don't be all things to all people. Okay, pick a target customer and focus on. Now, you, there's a tension there between, you know, coming across as though you're serving a niche. But remember, you can start out serving a niche, right? Who were, what was the niche that Facebook first served? Harvard, Harvard students, right? That's a teeny, teeny little market. Okay, but they crushed Harvard. They got. 95% of the undergrads using it in like two months or something crazy like that. Right? And then they expanded to Yale and Columbia and Stanford. And then they expanded to the rest of the Ivy League. And then, and so on and so on. And today, right, your grandmother's using it. Right? So that's, that's great. By the way, for the record, Mark Zuckerberg did not envision the Facebook that we know today. He just thought it was going to be the best Facebook for college students across the country which may have been a good market, okay? And that was probably what he was pitching back in whatever it was, 2004. So you can paint the, the larger market that you want to go after, but what's the path you're going to take to get there, right? As the great startup philosopher um, Yoda once said, the key to success I know not, but trying to please everyone, the key to failure is. Okay, so in those early days, it's really important to focus. Okay, also beware of the no competition trap. Everybody has competition. Even when you're at the top of the food chain, we all have competition. Remember, define that by how your customer solves the problem, not your technology. And also, beware of outsourcing. Okay, I've seen more startups struggle and ultimately die from trying to outsource their product development than I've seen succeed. And I have seen some succeed, but they're few and far between. Okay, and the reason for that is, is simple. Is even though it might be very economical to outsource to India or Poland or Uzbekistan or wherever, okay, you're not going to be able to iterate as rapidly as you can when your CTO is sitting next to you. Okay. And the guys in Uzbekistan are not going to have any insight into solving your customer's problem. They're going to do exactly what you tell them to code. And you're not, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to go so far as to say you're not going to get any creativity at them, but you're not going to get the same creativity from your CTO or engineers who actually engage with the customers like you do. 
okay? Um, so it's, it's just really challenging. And a lot of investors won't look at a, at a, at a startup that is not doing at least the majority of its development in-house. Now that said, our most successful startup, Brooklinen, doesn't have a technical founder on its team, but they're an e-commerce company. They were able to build their entire thing on top of Spotify, um, not Spotify, Shopify. Okay, so that's maybe an exception, right? We have another team that's uh, doing a marketplace for theater props, and they're building it on top of Magento. Okay, so there may be cases where you don't need that, but in most cases, you do. And the, you know, manufacturing physical products may be similar. You may not have to manufacture it, but you probably need to design it, right? Apple doesn't actually manufacture much anymore. But you notice what it says on their products. It also says, designed in California, made in China. Okay, so they design everything. They're designing their own chips now. I'm not saying you have to go to that level. Okay, but what's your secret? What's your advantage? What's your secret sauce? Is it your, or part of it, is, is it your engineering or design capability? You know, manufacturing physical products may make more sense to do it overseas. It may not. Then go, another one of our portfolio companies, right? They, um, actually this is a true story. Brian, the founder, was a Stern student. He went over and stalked the uh, folks at the robotics club over at Tandon until he found his co-founders. Then they were able to attract someone else. They designed and hand-built their first few. Then they got a local contract manufacturer okay, to make the next dozens. And then they scaled to another contract manufacturer who made the next 500. And now they're just looking at bringing it to another contract manufacturer that has both domestic and international manufacturing capabilities. So as they start to get into the thousands of units, then maybe it makes sense to move it to lower cost production in Asia. Okay, so anyway, probably more than you want to know about that. Um, no one is gonna read your business plan, and I mean that. Doesn't, I'm not saying don't waste your time with a business plan, though I'm not a big fan of them. Why is it asking? Who's asking? You'll, you will not hear a professional VC fund ask you for a business plan. They'll say, send me your pitch deck. Yeah, that's, 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 that's Okay. Some other people that, yeah. They're probably not worth their... Now, business, writing a business plan can be a useful process for you. Okay, but you get diminishing returns as you start to improve your grammar and add beautiful fonts and charts and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's more about what goes into it than the actual product itself. Um, don't send large files. Okay, remember, I actually read a lot of my email on my cell phone. And I'm you know, in and out of the subways and on the trains and coverage isn't always great. I can safely get a five or 10 megabyte file onto my phone or my iPad or my laptop if I'm on the train. But 550 megabytes, it'll take me hours. So there's a, a feature in PowerPoint and I assume Keynote has the same to compress images. Compress the hell out of them, okay? So that your file is as small as you can get. They'll, they'll open it quicker. That sounds like a good thing. Yes, Tim. All of the above. All of the above. So sometimes the written, like a business plan, does come in down. No, down. usually not. They might ask for written information, like if, if, if you if you have anything written, like you've done a competitive analysis, or maybe you got a business school student to do it for you. Can I? Yeah, sure, share that. Or patent applications, those are written. Or you did a grant application, or stuff that you have written. Or you know, I want to sit down with your CTO and better understand your architecture. Okay, well then your CTO should have a technical deck that explains what your thing is and how it works, if that's what they wanna know, okay? You know, you don't have to tell them everything on the first pitch, but be careful of coming across as secretive, okay? So you, you may have you know, certain, you know, an algorithm that you don't wanna share with them because you're not patent it, 
until you're under non-disclosure, and that usually doesn't happen until very late in the process with an investor. But know what you can talk about without compromising your IP, and know what you can't. And if, you know, people will respect that if you come across as open, if you come across as very closed and don't want to, like I literally had uh, an entrepreneur who wouldn't explain how his product worked and wouldn't actually show me the data that proved that it worked. And I'm like, well then I'm, I'm glad you got other angels to invest, but I can't invest in that. I like you, I believe you, I trust you, but I cannot invest the university's money on that basis. Sorry. Um, you will get challenged intentionally or unintentionally as part of this process. Don't be defensive. Take the questions and the feedback. Hear them. If they're questions, answer them. Okay? If you start arguing with the VC, it's a bad thing. Okay? It's hard to, this is really hard to do. This is your baby, you've been working on it for two years, and they're challenging the things that you believe in your heart and you believe are true. Okay? They may be right, they may be wrong. Arguing with them is not going to help, even if you're right. It's not about being right. It's not, I'm not saying capitulate and say you're right, but there is some middle ground. Okay? Um, don't be unresponsive. Okay, I'm not saying you have to answer an email and within five minutes of receiving it, but if you get an email from a VC and they ask you a question or something, don't wait days to answer it. So it says you're not serious or you're not paying attention or, or I don't know what. Okay, it's not, I'm not saying it's, you know, when I say jump, how high? But you should be responsive and engaged in the process. Okay, um, I hate useless animations. <laughs> and I also hate difficult to read colors and fonts. Okay, things, this actually does not look nearly as good on here as it does on my computer. So find a shitty projector somewhere and see how your slides mm -hmm. look to make sure that they're readable. I made this intentionally difficult to read to prove my point. But animations and transitions and all that, keep it simple. You can use builds to make points if you know how to do that in PowerPoint or Keynote, but otherwise focus on, on keeping it simple. The other thing I'll say is I hate slides like this. Okay, long list, lots of reading, and this could be a lot worse. Okay, so this is just the, the points, that, the pictures that I just showed you. So I tried to actually illustrate the point I was making before, right? You notice these were all pictures, right? I, I could talk to these, right? Can, I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's, it's useful, right? And I could have had, I wasn't, but I could have had very detailed notes here that I was reading, and I had your attention. You were focused on me, because you could process this slide in a second. It's nothing to read, okay? Um, so, questions? So on the final part, you can't make your page If they're telling you they're not interested, that's the best clue. Yeah, if they're straightforward. <laughs> um, if they stop responding. So here's a, a nice trick is, you know, if you write to them and they don't respond, you know, wait three, five, seven days. Okay, don't on, on Monday respond to something you sent on Friday. Three to five, seven business days and just write, what I call the thin veneer of guilt, right? It's the one line that says, just want to make sure this didn't slip between the cracks. You know, can we speak ne again next week? Or let me know what the next steps are. Or I'll call you on, you know, whatever, just some kind of next step. And that brings it back to the top of their inbox and just kind of reminds them that they blew you off as politely as you possibly can, okay? Um, and if they don't respond to that, I mean, I, I, every VC I know lives and dies on email. They're, 
They're you know, as obsessed as anybody with responding to emails. It's the lifeblood of their business. So they saw it. Just you know, how many, now then they're busy. I mean, they're not sitting around hanging on you know, your every key type. Um, but if after you know, a couple of weeks you haven't heard back from them, you, know, you can maybe send the thin veneer of guilt twice. But after that, you're, you're wasting bits and time. It's 6 o'clock. Um, you know, the other thing that you can do, if they do respond and they say no, you can ask them for feedback. Just be really clear in both your words and your um, style that you're not trying to change their mind. Okay? Say, you know, any feedback so I can improve this as I pitch other investors. Some people will still not, okay? Some people might. Um, don't get into an ongoing, you know, if they say, you're too early, don't write back and say, what do you mean? Right, then you're going to start to annoy them. But you, you try to, you know, if you have specific questions that you think they can answer, and you're going to be pitching to a lot of them, so hopefully you'll get some feedback. You can also back channel through contacts. Right? In fact, uh, there was a, just a blog post I read this morning that actually suggested that you know, maybe a, uh, a, another investor that you know right. might be able, or an entrepreneur that you know who knows them, might be, they might be willing to tell them, well, I didn't like him because I hate guys in three-piece suits. <laughs> Well, no, I think in, as I showed you in the example pitch, I think you should have, you know, um, what, you're at, what you're asking for, um, you know, something like this. You also remember is I might then take this deck, you know, we had a good meeting and I got to show it, you know, show it to one of my partners or an associate and, you know, I, I want the majority of the information to be there for them. I mean, I probably will send a note along with it, but don't make more work for me. Yes? Um, in terms of presenting your team and like the slides for your team, it's great if you can say that you have that many years of experience with that particular firm. But say you're a team of undergrad students and like and you don't have that experience, what should you focus on? Um, so you, you should certainly mention where you go to school. You, sh you probably have had some internship experience. Right, you can highlight that. Um, I would say courses are not necessarily all that valuable um, to highlight. Uh, you know, if you were in, you know, the Summer Launchpad Accelerator at NYU, you could mention that. If uh, I wouldn't say you went to startup school, but you know, if you were in a program or something that was hard to get into, you know, maybe you, uh, you know, got some kind of scholarship. You know, shows that you're really smart. Uh, you know, you got to find proxies. You test it with someone else to see what's what's meaningful or not. But I I I, I get the challenge, right? You're a first-time entrepreneur. You're young. Um, um, but you know, or I mean, also if, if there are, you know, if let's say you're the the CTO and you know you could say you were a hack and why fellow and you won the NYU hacks competition or something like that that show that you have some credibility in that regard um, if, your, if your team is they're full of like you know, really technical people with a lot of experience or like are really you know, well um, in that in their field and then you're you know not you're like you're an undergrad right so like well, how do you how do you display that without you know getting all like I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, if you are like the least experienced mem member of the team, okay. then like, how do you portray that in like, a good way? I, th I think I'd have to. Uh, you you have advice? I'm, I'm just gonna say you probably have a different skill set than those people mm -hmm. that you want to advertise. Like, say you're really good at marketing, like you may not know how to build a website, mm -hmm. but you can advertise really well and talk to people. Like, I, don't I think that's good advice. Okay, last question. 
Okay, so uh, if, if you got a couple of meetings with a bunch of doctors and uh, none of them got back to you, uh, do you usually give, uh, do they usually give feedback? No. Or, so what, what is the next step? Well, you can ask some of them for it, and they may or may not. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you can try to get some back channel comments uh, on it. Um, and then, you know, if, well, you should talk to us. I mean, we'll probably, we'll listen to your pitch and we'll give you unvarnished feedback. Um, so that, that's what I would do. Or, and or, you know, if you're not here, this is 10 years from now, keep trying or try to find someone who can give you feedback, even if they're not necessarily really going to invest in you. Maybe they're a friend, maybe they're a VC, but who doesn't focus on your industry or something like that who can give you some unvarnished feedback.